Hi, I'm Dr. KJ Foster, and this is Fostering Resilience, where I bring you everything you ever wanted to know about addiction recovery. In today's video, I'm sharing with you 10 common myths about addiction recovery. They're not all of the myths that are out there, but they're 10 of the most common myths that I have found in working with people who are struggling with addiction and their family members, basically people who are not yet educated about addiction and they just don't know because there's a lot of misinformation that's floating around out there. So I'm sharing with you 10 of the most common ones that I hear from people that I have worked with and that I've come across in my own experience. So that's what I'm sharing with you today. If this is your first time clicking on one of my videos, welcome. I'm so happy to have you. And if you're returning, welcome back. Either way, if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, there should be a subscribe now that's gonna come across the screen up there. If you could please click on that for me and subscribe to my channel, I would so appreciate it. And if you click on the bell, when the bell pops up, you will be alerted to every time I upload a new video. So myth number one, and these myths I'm not uh, providing in any particular order. They're just 10 of the most common that I tend to see uh, with individuals that, I, that I've heard about. Um, so number one is recovery is a cure, which is completely false. Recovery is not a cure, but oftentimes people believe that recovery is a cure. And once you've reached the, the point of addiction, that there's no curing the addiction, there's treating the addiction, and you can recover from the addiction. So I like to compare it to like a cancer, like a tumor. You know, you have a, a cancerous tumor and you can put that into remission. You know, the goal in addiction recovery is to weaken the addiction and to build the individual um, to make them stronger and stronger and stronger. So I like to use myself as an example, like I'm very strong in my recovery and I do certain things every single day to maintain that strength and to keep my recovery strong. But if I wasn't doing those things, then that would make my risk for relapse a lot higher. And if I were to pick up a drink or a drug, that would absolutely um, reestablish my addiction and grow the tumor um, exponentially and go right back to that weakened state. So it can be treated, it can be put in remission, but it absolutely um, cannot be cured. Myth number two. Myth number two is the belief by family members that they don't have to participate in their own therapy or their own recovery program, and that's just not true. Research has shown that the more that the family members can participate in family therapy, the more that they can participate in their own recovery program, the better off their loved one and the entire family recovery is going to be because the reality is, is that the addiction impacts the entire family unit because as the loved one struggles more and more with their addiction, the communication breaks down and the whole family unit becomes very dysfunctional. So it's very important that the family members are educated, that the family members are participating in their own recovery program, whether that's Al-Anon, CODA, whether that's individual therapy, but that they are doing something to address their own individual recovery. Myth number three. Myth number three is the idea that if I go to detox, then that'll be enough. That all I need to do is go to detox or what I often see as well is that the individual will go to detox and then they'll commit to going to, to participate in 28 days of treatment and they'll decide that after they've been in treatment for one week that they're strong enough that they're okay and they'll be okay to leave and they convince their family members that they're okay and um, that they're strong enough to leave to leave treatment and that's just not the case detox alone if that's all you do if you just go to detox and you go right back into your environment and you're not participating in any other type of recovery program, you're not doing anything else, then your risk for relapse is very, very high. And the same thing with treatment. If you've 
you know, committed to participate in a treatment program and you decide, you know, a week or two in that you don't need any more treatment and again, you, you just go home and you go back to your same old routine, then your risk for relapse is very, very high. Recovery is a process that takes a significant amount of time. So it's very important for family members to realize and for the individual who has become addicted to realize that it, it takes a lot of time and, and significant amount of treatment, whether that's you know, participating in something like AA or Smart Recovery or whatever the program is that you choose. I don't, I, I'm not here to, to push any particular program, but I am here to say that you need to be participating in some sort of recovery program in order to move forward and get stronger and healthier in your recovery process. Myth number four. Myth number four is the idea that if my loved one truly loved me, if they loved me, they wouldn't be doing this. They wouldn't continue to drink. They wouldn't continue to drug if they truly loved me. And that is a myth because it, it's not about love. I mean, when it comes to addiction, the addiction is a brain disease and the addiction takes over an individual's thinking, it takes over their feelings, it takes over their actions, and they're actually doing things that are going against their true self and their true feelings and their true motives. So the idea that if my loved one truly loved me, they would be able to stop is just not true because it's not about love at all. In fact, this is a, a, a part that really contributes to a lot of shame that comes with addiction because the individual struggling with the addiction does love their family members and they do love their family members and, it's not, and, and they feel the guilt and the shame after starting to recover and kind of coming out of that, that mental fog and the um, the takeover that happens where the addiction actually hijacks the person and so anybody familiar with that I think can understand how it completely takes over somebody's thinking, it completely takes over their behavior and that they are in fact not really themselves. So this idea that if they just loved me they would be able to stop is just not true. Myth number five. Myth number five is the idea that abstinence alone means that you're recovering or that your loved one is recovering and that's absolutely not true. So they, they may um, be able to stay sober or stay clean or whatever the case may be by abstinence alone but with abstinence, they're typically not going to be very happy because the underlying issues that are driving or were driving the addiction to begin with, unless they are treated, the risk for relapse is significantly higher and also the, um, the likelihood that that individual is going to be very unhappy, angry, discontent, um, is very, very high. So this idea that, oh, my loved one's not drinking, they're not drugging, but they're not doing anything else to treat their addiction is absolutely um, does not mean they're recovering. They are really just sort of like standing still in their recovery. They're not progressing toward any type of healing. Myth number six. Myth number six is this idea that if, my, if, if you or your loved one is taking any form of medication such as antidepressants that that means that they're not sober or that they're not recovering and that's, you may hear um, conflicting points of view on this but my point of view and from what I've seen in my experience in the field is that this is absolutely not true that some people require antidepressants for a period of time to be able to get through that initial phase of recovery in the early, early on when it's especially high and when the cravings and the triggers are especially high. So 
anything, I, you know, I would recommend nothing narcotic, of course, but there are plenty of non-narcotic antidepressants. And if it's going to help the person get through that initial phase of recovery, then that's absolutely something that I consider and many people that I work with, doctors, psychiatrists, to be very beneficial for somebody in recovery. Myth number seven. Myth number seven is the idea that you or your loved one, once you get out of treatment, are okay to be around your drug using friends or family members. And that is absolutely not true. It is not safe to be around individuals that are using drugs or drinking or whatever the case may be. It puts the individual at a very high risk for relapse. And no matter what the individual is saying, even if the individual is telling you, oh, I'll be fine, I can go to that, you know, that event, or I can go hang out with so-and-so and I'll be fine. They may believe that, they may believe it to their core, that they wanna stay sober and that they'll be okay and that they're not gonna drink or drug, but the reality is, is because of the neuro connections that are, that are formed in the brain, that once the individual is actually in that situation where they're with those individuals, there's gonna be a release that happens in their brain, a chemical release that is going to make, that's going to create a craving that is so strong that that individual will not be able to resist that craving that happens. So it's absolutely not safe in early recovery for the individual to be around their drinking and drug using friends or family members. Recovery myth number eight. Recovery myth number eight is the idea that you are somehow responsible as the loved one for, for your loved one's recovery. And the idea, if you're the identified individual in recovery, that somebody else is responsible for your recovery. And what I mean by this is like, I hear family members a lot saying that they, they'll call their their loved one and ask them if they've attended a meeting or you know what they're doing for their recovery and and not really allowing the individual to be responsible for their own recovery and recovery is all about being responsible for yourself so i i emphasize to family members and to the people in treatment that each the more that each individual person can focus on themselves and be responsible for their own recovery, the better off everybody's going to be and that uh, the person themselves needs to be, re to be responsible for their own recovery, not to put it on somebody else, not to try to make somebody else responsible, which happens a lot. You know, I hear people say, well, I relapsed because this person didn't pick up my phone call, or I relapsed because this person didn't do X, Y, or Z, and they're making it other people's responsibility and other people's fault that they relapsed and not taking responsibility for themselves. So the more that each individual person in the family can take responsibility for their own recovery, the better off everyone's going to be and the more likely that each person's going to be in being successful in their own recovery process. Recovery myth number nine. Myth number nine is the idea of trust, that you can trust your loved one um, or the loved one, the individual in treatment, believing that their family members should trust them. So I'm here to tell both sides, each of you, that that's just not the case. That, you know, trust is is lost during the addiction process. You know, when when you or your loved one is is in the depths of addiction, you know, there are a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of lying, um, maybe even stealing that, that has occurred, um, betrayal. And so that, that trust just goes right out the window and that trust does not come back quickly and should not come back based upon, based upon what somebody says 
you know, the trust comes back slowly and it needs to come back through behavior. And that's why this idea of focusing on your own recovery, because family members will say to me, well, how do I know that my loved one is doing the right thing? How do I know that they're going to their meetings or they're participating in their program, whatever that may be? And I tell them, you'll know you'll know, you'll see it in their behavior, you'll, you will know, but it's not going to be helpful to be asking them about it or quizzing them about it or any, any of those types of behavior. But also not necessarily blanketly trusting the loved one. I think that that needs to be established over time and, and recognizing that it's going to take time for that trust to be built back. So the family member recognizing, no, you know, you shouldn't trust your loved one right off the bat when they come back from treatment. And the individual who's struggling with addiction recognizing that it's going to take a lot of action and integrity and continued positive action to build back that trust. But that you can do it and that it will happen if you just keep moving forward with your recovery process. And finally, recovery myth number 10. Recovery myth number 10 is the idea that relapse means failure. And that is absolutely not the case. And this is kind of a, a tricky one in terms of I don't want to overstate it in terms of some individuals kind of grabbing on to the fact that, oh, well, relapse is okay. Well, like KJ said, that relapse is okay. And that's not necessarily what I'm saying because the reality is, is that addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder. And so it's very difficult uh, to maintain abstinence and, and to recover. It's a very challenging and difficult process but that doesn't mean like if you do relapse it doesn't mean that treatment failed it doesn't mean that you failed it, it gives you an opportunity if you're lucky if you you survive the relapse because there are situations where you're not guaranteed to come back from a relapse but should you relapse recognizing that this is an opportunity to look at ways in which you can change up your program to ensure that you're successful this time. So in, in my case, I chronically relapsed for five years over and over and over again, and I needed to get to a point where I, I was able to look at the reasons why I was continuing to relapse, and, and I ultimately came to the conclusion that I needed to do things totally differently than I was doing them previously in order to get a different result. So it gives the individual an opportunity to reassess what happened, what led to the relapse, so that they can change their program and become more successful at maintaining their recovery. And one more quick thing that I want to mention about relapse is something called the abstinence violation effect. And what that means is it's something that happens when somebody picks up a drink or a drug after a period of abstinence and instead of just recognizing that they made a mistake and that, you know, this is something that, that they don't want to continue with and kind of getting back on track again right away, this abstinence violation effect happens where mentally we we say to ourselves, oh, I screwed up, you know, I lost my days, like I screwed up my recovery, I might as well go all out, I might as well make this relapse worth it. And they go from just maybe having one or two drinks or, you know, picking up their substance one time to this full-blown relapse and that just doesn't need to happen. So understanding that there's a difference between a slip and like this full-blown all-out relapse and your mind telling you that because you relapsed you have to make it somehow worth it when the reality is is by doing that you could potentially not survive that relapse so just the sooner you're able to catch it and get back on track of course the better off you're going to be and give me a thumbs up if you've liked this video. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and I hope to see you back here next time. In the meantime, have a beautiful and a blessed day. Namaste.